this meeting. Um, and today, actually, is the day of our annual general meeting, which is a very special day for us. But uh, it's been made an extra special day because our guest speaker today is Mrs. Kate Thomas, CVO, who is the Lord Lieutenant of Midland Morgan. Now, the Lord Lieutenants, uh, HMI, the Queen's official representative in their counties, it is without doubt a great honour to be appointed to that office. And of course, Lord Lieutenants are charged with a range of important duties and responsibilities. And Mrs. Thomas will tell us all about that role and those duties. I'm also delighted to welcome Miss Mary Squire, who is clerk to the Lieutenancy and is also a resident of Fourth Call. Don't she? Uh? <laughs> well, it's a great honour for me to have the Lord Lieutenant and the clerk with us today. So please give them a very warm welcome and I have great pleasure now in inviting Mrs. Thomas to address us. Pardon me while I get mic'd up. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that welcome. It was very nice. And it's very good to be here, particularly to come to Paul's Call on such a glorious day. It takes me back to my childhood. I find when giving these talks that uh, the question I'm most frequently asked is, how do you get to be a Lord Lieutenant? Um, so I'll start with that by saying I don't really know. Um, I can give you a rough idea of how it works and who takes the decisions and who comes to those decisions. And I can say that I didn't jump fully fledged into the role of Lord Lieutenant. You have to be fairly high profile to start with. It's not a job you can fill up an application form for, although there are some who'd like to think that possible. So all I can tell you is how it went for me and spend a little time telling you how I got there before I'll tell you what I do now I am there. In January 1967, as a, a townie, I married a farmer, Edward moving from the centre of Cardiff to a hill farm in the area known as the Valleys. What I knew about this area was restricted to the fact that nobody from Cardiff shopped in Cardiff on a Thursday afternoon because on a Thursday afternoon the Valleys came to Cardiff. And also that a maroon bus went up Cathedral Road past our house to this mythical place called the Valleys that none of my friends had ever been to. But the tug of love was strong, so I headed for the hills. And for years in Nelson, I was known as the girl who married Edward Penwine. When I'd had time to get used to farming life and had produced two boys, I got involved in some village activities. I chaired the village playgroup. And then there was the Red Cross, which was very active in those days and of which my mother-in-law was director for the northeast of the county. She was the boss in more ways than one. We had good fun doing first aid training, looking after the elderly when they were, they were evacuated to Tintilla because of floods on the River Taff, helping in the miners' rest home in Porth Call, which I know will be very close to all your hearts, and making pounds and pounds and pounds of marmalade in the farm kitchen to sell in aid of the Red Cross. But on the occasion of a visit to Red Cross headquarters in pont Pris, a visit by the Countess Alexander of Tunis, I met that year's High Sheriff, a gentleman called Eddie Ray. Now it's the job of the High Sheriff to nominate somebody to be High Sheriff in three years' time a sort of ongoing successor. And for some reason, Eddie thought that I might be able to do the job. And I can remember quite clearly, we were sitting in the kitchen having supper, and the telephone went, and I answered it, 
and I came back to the table and I said to Edward, I've just been asked if I'd be High Sheriff. And I had to admit that I hadn't got a clue what a High Sheriff did or the remotest idea of how that was going to completely change my life. Um, I was a farmer's wife from the hills and I suddenly became a high profile female just at the time that Maggie Thatcher was saying we must have more women in public life. <laughs> my timing was immaculate. Um, as many of you will know, uh, the post of High Sheriff is one of the most ancient of public offices in England, dating back to 992 AD, uh, but in Wales only at the time of um, Henry VIII in 1536. And the first High Sheriff of Glamorgan was a gentleman called George Herbert, who uh, lived uh, outside Swansea on the Gower. Old-time high sheriffs had great fun. I mean, they could collect taxes, they could raise armies, and really the job was very much sought after, and sadly neither the taxis, taxes or the armies were still there when, when I came along. But some of the old high sheriffs behaved abominably. They really did. Sheriffs were accused of bribery, selling positions, feuds, even piracy in the Bristol Channel. There were attacks on country houses, sword fights on the streets of Cardiff and in the Isle of Gethigair Church. A chap called Edward Chemis, who came from this part of the world, served three terms as High Sheriff, roughly ten years apart. He was accused of abusing his position, taken to the court of the Star Chamber, imprisoned and fined £500. Now, we're talking about £500 in about 1600 and I can't do the maths, but that is one heck of a lot of money. But he was, however, so powerful that he came back and served another term as High Sheriff, even after all that. But as I said, all that had gone <coughs> by my time, sadly. My main jobs were to look after High Court judges, raise money for charity, go to dinners and receptions, and put on weight. <laughs> Edward and I ate some enormous wheel meals and listened to some very good speakers and some atrociously bad. We entertained 22 different judges, held 27 dinner parties, and all in all, it truly was the most life-changing year. When my year was over, thanks to Maggie Thatcher, I found myself being offered all sorts of unpaid jobs, uh, mainly with charities. The biggest of these was the Prince's Trust. In 1988, when I joined, the Trust was divided into four different charities, each with its own chairman and board, and I became chairman of what was known as the Prince's Trust Action. A few, minute, a few years later, I moved across to the British, uh, to the uh, Prince's Trust Bro, the environmental body that took over from the old Prince of Wales Committee that many of you will remember. The Prince of Wales, I can then say, was getting a little fed up with having his charity in four different pieces. He wanted a one-stop shop one place that a youngster in difficulties could ring one telephone number, say what he needed and be put through to the right department. And so Wales was given the task of putting all the bits together, and we had more bits in Wales because we had the environmental arm that they didn't have, bringing them all together under one roof to show the rest of Britain how it could be done. It was not easy. But in the end, we managed it, and it became uh, Prince's Trust Wales, and I became chairman of the, the new organization. There'd been so many stories. Oh, if we, if we don't have our own name, nobody will give us any money anymore. Um, oh, you know, if we change it, the, the, the young people we're trying to deal with won't understand. But in fact, it worked infinitely better because we did manage to have one office, one telephone number, 
giving young people one place to come if they needed help. Then, Eureka, in 1999, I was offered my first paid job, that of chairman of Midler Morgan Family Health Services Authority. Nowadays, you have to apply for this sort of job. Um, you have to fill in an application form and find referees and go and be interviewed. But back then, I just had a letter from the Secretary of State for Wales asking me if I would be chairman. And one of my committee members is nodding his head in the back there, David Deer, because he sat with me on, on health committees. It was, it was quite a useful way. I mean, you didn't actually have to do anything except say yes or no, which would be completely frowned upon in this day of age when everything is advertised and people get to, get to apply. But I still think we managed to get some pretty good people. Don't you think so, David? <laughs> um, after four years, I moved to Midland Morgan Health Authority, looking after the hospitals, and then they merged Mid and South Glamorgan, and I took over the chair of the new combined authority. They were ten years of constant change, trying to keep services on an evil keel while everything around was bubble, bubble, boil and trouble. My, my strongest memory is of having continual indigestion. And every time I wake up in the morning and I switch the radio on and there is something about hospitals misbehaving or some problems in health, I lie back and I think, thank you, God, that's nothing to do with me anymore. But as you can imagine, as a result of the work on the health authority and the fact that I was chairing the Prince's Trust, I was becoming pretty well known, almost a, a different person from the one who'd answered the phone in the farm kitchen back in 1984. And my, my, my life was going down some totally unexpected pathways. Because of my health connections, I was invited to be honorary colonel of the Welsh Field Hospital, the TA Medics. I had never had anything to do with the armed forces. The army's habit of talking in initials had always totally flummoxed me. I can remember on the morning of my inauguration as High Sheriff that I was standing there half-dressed and half-undressed and the telephone went and I picked it up and said hello and a voice said, this is the PA to the ADC to the GOC. <laughs> I said, I beg your pardon? This is the PA to the ADC to the GOC. It turned out that a general who was invited to my inauguration wanted to know whether he had to wear uniform or not. But you find the army loves talking in initials, and it's one of the things that you really have to get used to. But I must admit, I loved being called Mom and Colonel. I really did. Um, uh, it, oh, it was wonderful. It really was. I'm losing my place. Oh, there we are. Um, with 203, I got to do some incredibly exciting things. I went with them to, to Bosnia and to Kosovo, two stunningly beautiful countries, utterly ruined by war and man's inhumanity to man. In, in Bosnia, we, to get to Bosnia, we flew into Split, in Croatia, which is now, I'm told by my sons who've been there, is now a rather nice holiday destination. We flew into Split and had to take a, a Chinook helicopter ride from there up to Banja Luka, which is in the north of Serbia. And um, it was incredibly noisy. Uh, you couldn't hear a word. You have to wear uh, ear defenders. And it's slightly unnerving to know that you're flying barely higher than this table uh, over land with soldiers uh, with the back of the, he the helicopter open, the sides open, with soldiers with their legs hanging out, sitting there with their guns in, in case we are attacked. So it was quite a new experience for me. And then coming back down, for some reason, the helicopters were grounded and we had to come down as part of an armoured convoy the whole of the length of, of Serbia from Banja Luka in the north. It was quite incredible because it's a, a stunningly beautiful country, very like Switzerland or Austria, with beautiful rivers and, uh, and, um, and mountains. 
And, and yet, you'd, we went past entire villages that had been ethnically cleansed. Uh, in some places, there'd be some people still living there, but other houses, you could see um, machine gun bits of the walls and the roofs had been taken off because those who weren't of the right ethnicity had been killed and their houses demolished so that, that nobody could come back and live there. And in another place, an entire empty village, nobody living there at all. And I can see it now, this snow on the field in front of this village. And walking across the field very slowly were wolves. And I thought, yes, man goes, nature soon takes over. It was, um, it was very sobering. In Kosovo, we were going on a trip to, from the British Field Hospital down to the American Field Hospital, which was typical of Americans everywhere. They just take America with them. Um, they, what they'd done in, in Kosovo, they'd taken the top off a mountain, put a wire fence around it, and put inside that everything that a GI would expect to find if he was in barracks in America. There, was, um, there were Big Macs, there was cinema, there was everything that you could think of. It was so different from where we were in ours. But in fact, coming back, we flew into a snowstorm and had to do an emergency landing which is um, um, something I really don't recommend to anybody. I don't think I've ever been more scared in my life. I thought my end had come. In Pristina, the capital, I went on foot patrol um, with um, the, the army who were there. And I met elderly couples living in flats in Pristina who had not been out over their doorstep. They were so frightened, probably for six months had not left their flats. I heard of a farmer who'd been killed by a landmine which had been laid in the front doorstep of his farmhouse so that he went out to work in the fields and he came back that night and put his foot on the doorstep and was blown up. Um, Serbs and Albanians continually at each other's throats and you couldn't say that there was one good and one bad because they were all just as bad as each other and it just depended who was getting the upper hand at any particular time. Now I'm not honorary colonel at 203 anymore. I did eight years which I loved, absolutely adored, um, but I'm now their patron instead which is, means very nicely that they invite me to anything but sadly I didn't manage to go out to Afghanistan with them. You may have read in the papers that the Welsh Field Hospital have just returned from six months uh, in Afghanistan. They were away over Christmas. Uh, they've just had a, uh, a march uh, to welcome them home through Rudri in, in Gwent. And they've got a big welcome home uh, march through Cardiff in April. So if any of you are going to be in Cardiff, I can't remember the exact date. Um, but go and cheer and salute our doctors, nurses, medical technicians and others, all from local hospitals within Wales, um, who have just managed to come back safely from Afghanistan. They are a truly wonderful set of people. I can't tell you. They're wonderful. So with all that lot under my belt, um, in April 1989, I was made a deputy lieutenant. Now, there are lots of deputy lieutenants in, in every county. It goes on head of population. I think I'm allowed 30. Yes, I thought it was. I had to rely on Mary, my clerk. Um, so I'm allowed 30, of which I think we've now got about 20. Yeah. Um, so it's not so much a job. It's more a sort of recognition for people of things that they've done. They've worked well for charity. They've done things. Um, but I will, on occasion, use them. I will talk to them and um, suggest perhaps if I can't go to a funeral, one of them might go to a funeral for me, or they might go to, um, um, what do you call those? Citizenship. Citizenship. Citizenship ceremonies for me, those sort of things. Um, but I also have a Vice Lord Lieutenant, and most of you will know who that is. If I say Roy Noble, is there anybody here who doesn't know who Roy <laughs> Noble is? <laughs> um, 
And um, in 94, I actually became Murray McLagan's Vice Lord Lieutenant. So you can see I was sort of working my way up through the ranks. Um, I, it's a job that I hold from, uh, from my appointment, which was January the 1st, 2003, until my 75th birthday, and I flatly refuse to tell you when that is. <laughs> it's coming up not too far away. So now that I've sort of brought you roughly up to date as to how I got to where I am, I'll tell you a little of the history of the job itself. Once again, we go back to the time of Henry VIII, when some counties had lieutenancies who, could, who were appointed to take over the military duties of the then very badly behaving high sheriffs. They raised and were responsible for a local militia that they actually led in times of war. With the threat of invasion by Spain under Queen Elizabeth, she decided that there should be lieutenancy appointments in all counties of, of England and Wales. And their official title was his or her majesty's lieutenant for the county of. But as most of them were lords, which doesn't hold good anymore, most of them were lords, they became known as the lord lieutenant of a county but we are Lord Lieutenants. We are not Lord's Lieutenant, if you see the difference. Brings us down a peg or two. In 1908, King Edward VII made the office of Lord Lieutenant the prime office under the crown, then technically pushing the high sheriffs down a bit and coming in on top. Um, we, were, we are appointed by the Queen on the advice of Downing Street, the appointment is honorary, and we receive absolutely no pay. Although we do get, um, I can charge um, mileage for petrol, I can get money back for stamps. They provide my stationery. Um, but, uh, I get nothing for my clothes. Um, the men who wear uniform have to buy that uniform themselves. And I mean, I'm, I remember with 203, my mess kit uh, nearly 16 years ago was 700 pounds. So it would probably be just over a thousand today. So if you imagine a male Lord Lieutenant has to buy cap, cape, boots, two lots of trousers, jacket, spurs, sword, you're probably not getting away less than about two, hundred, two, two and a half thousand, something like that, and you don't get anything towards it. <coughs> when the Lord Lieutenant retires, the Vice Lord Lieutenant does not automatically take over. Um, it's up to the Welsh Government to say, take soundings. They talk to the retiring Lord Lieutenant, they talk to the local councils, and they talk to many other people. They then put forward suggestions to Downing Street. So when Murray McLagan said he was going to retire, he actually went three years early through ill health, um, I knew that my name would have gone forward, but I had no way of knowing whether or not I was going to be it uh, until I actually had a letter from the Prime Minister saying that he was minded to put my name forward to the Queen, and if he did, would I accept? Um, England, I have to say, is a little posher with, uh, with its um, appointments. Amongst the English LLs, there's one duchess, two countesses, a viscount, four lords, five knights, four dames, three ladies, and one on. In Wales, we have two ons, one missus, one doctor, one judge, and three misters, <laughs> which means that we're inclined to feel rather slightly out of it when we all meet for the AGM in London. But they're actually, some of them are really very pleasant. <laughs> some. <laughs> what are my duties? Well, it's really, I, here I have to say, what are our duties? Because while I get all the kudos, Mary does all the work. And if you take one thing away from today, it's the fact that I balance on Mary's shoulders. I was lucky enough to to inherit Mary, who had been clerk for um, Murray McLagan. So when I came in, not really knowing very much at all, Mary knew everything. 
So if I say we are responsible for the planning of royal visits, um, okay, I chat to Mary, we agree that we'll put a, a, a wanted visit forward. Mary will then be contacted by the palace who will say, um, yes, we're coming. So then Mary works with the palace and organizes recce's. She then deals with program after program after program, which she faxes to me. This is the latest draft. This is the latest draft. I can't finish this because we're waiting for them to give us names of people who are coming. So I say very loosely, we organize royal visits. What I really mean is Mary organizes royal visits and I turn up and um, I get to greet him or her getting out of their car, getting out of their plane, getting off their train, whatever. Take them to wherever the thing is where I introduce them to Mary, who has done all the work, and then introduce them to the, the rest of the people who are going to be introduced. I represent the Queen including duties with the armed forces and presenting certain honours, medals and awards. I do uh, fire and police long service awards. Um, I have presented um, a number of Elizabeth Crosses. Are you all aware of the Elizabeth Cross? It's a new thing that's come in, um, which is awarded to the close relative of anybody who has died on active service. Now this was backdated to um, the crime, I was going to say Crimea, Korean War, I, I think. So in fact, I, this do, I've had, I bought some things, programs of things that you can all have a look at if you want. Um, I did um, Elizabeth Cross to somebody who died in, um, wait a minute, that's South Kaborgan, find me. Can't turn the page, beg your pardon. Um, well, let's say he, uh, Private Johnson died in 1952, uh, Petty Officer Merrick in 58, uh, Cook Cuspert in 72, um, Lance Corporal in 72, somebody else in 82, somebody in 1990. So these were presented to fathers, father, sister, daughter, widow, mother, um, which really, was, is, is a very nice thing for them to have and they have a, a fairly large badge that they can wear on days like Remembrance Sunday and a much smaller one that they can wear day in and day out if they want to. So um, that, that's, um, you know, the, the, the Elizabeth Medal. We also do British Empire medals um, when they come along and there is somebody present here um, who knows about that but I can't see him for the kids no. he's sitting at the back I think and um, we also do um, MBEs, OBEs and CBEs if the recipient so wishes because when you, when you are given an award you get a letter saying that you are invited to the palace or to um, uh, Windsor Castle uh, but you can say if you'd prefer to have it elsewhere so we have, in fact, we've presented, uh, I've presented um, uh, MBE to somebody who wanted it where he works with his workmates around, to a doctor who wanted it in his garden with all his friends around having a garden party. We had one lady who was dying of cancer in hospital in Aberdeer, and her husband wrote to the, back to the palace and said, well, you know, it's wonderful she's got this, but she's far too ill, she won't be able to collect it. So the palace really did pull their finger out. They, they sent the medal and things down by motorbike outrider to get to us almost immediately. Uh, the hospital got together a gathering of her friends and family. Within 48 hours of hearing about it, we had the medal presentation to this lady at her bedside in hospital and she died the next morning. So uh, her family, particularly her husband, were so totally thrilled that she'd actually had it presented before she died. It didn't just arrive and be put somewhere. So that was quite very important for both of us, wasn't it? So um, it was some, um, that was actually very moving. We do the um, Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, which is presented to charities. 
and the Queen's Business Awards for Trade, Innovation, Sustainable Development and all these things. Um, I think this is almost the first year since the, um, the voluntary service one that we haven't actually had an award winner in Midland Morgan, isn't it? Well, we, we, when they first started, we had a winner after, after a winner after a winner. So I think I need to pull my finger up and out and um, do something to bounce that up a bit. Um, one of the nicest bits of our job is, is preparing the lists for people invited to garden parties at Buckingham Palace. And uh, we get told... <laughs> Was that you being or you want to go, sir? <laughs> um, um, we get told um, in advance, usually it's about January, just after Christmas, um, how many we're going to be allowed to send. Nobody can go twice, um, but uh, we then sort of uh, write out to all the deputy lieutenants and ask for suggestions. I take suggestions from anyone. So, so if any of you know somebody who's done a lot of work on the quiet for anything, charity or, or looking after other people or any of these things, and you think that they deserve a trip to Buckingham Palace to a garden party, Contact me or contact Mary. We're, throughout the year, we're taking names. We're, this year, it's all done, ready for uh, May and June. But we're already beginning to take note of possible names for next year. So if you do think of anybody, and I'm really serious about this, Mary and I would love to hear from you. So please give it some thought. Um, with the armed forces, I occasionally inspect the troops on parade, taking the salute. I've attended funerals of servicemen killed on operations and taken part in other ceremonial functions. Uh, I have to say that going to some of the funerals of young men killed in operations has been, because I have sons of my own, one of the worst things I, I've ever had to do. And um, the first one I went to, the coffin came into, um, into church to the music from Titanic. And I find I cannot now listen to that music from Titanic without bursting into tears, which is really very stupid. I have a lot to do with the Glamorgan Cadets. I've just retired as President of the Reserve Forces and Cadets Association for Wales. As I was saying to some, while we were having lunch, I have a couple, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four, uh, three this year, Lord Lieutenant Cadets, who are the cream of the crop. Their names are put forward by their squadrons, uh, and their names are then put forward to me, and I choose. And this year we have three cracking youngsters, two girls and a boy, two from the air cadets, one's an army cadet. I have great difficulty to remember their names because they all begin with a J. <laughs> and there's a Jess and a Jenna and a J J Jacob? Joshua. Joshua, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do have difficulty. Um, some years are much better than others for them because we try and give them as varied uh, uh, time as we can, but it doesn't always work. Some years, like a couple of years ago when it was the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, there were constant things going on, so the cadets had a wonderful year. The, uh, the odd year will come along where we'll only have one rather low-key royal visit. So then they will only have done the um, High Sheriff's inauguration, which they come to in uniform. They'd have done one royal visit. And then we're thinking, oh, poor dabs, you know, they're not really having much fun. There must be something else we can do. Um, but some years are just more exciting than others, realistically. Um, but they, they, are, they are such nice kids. They really are. Um, the one, I had an air cadet in 2003, which is an incredibly long time ago now, um, who invited me to go as his guest to a dinner at RAF St. Athen, which I thought took a lot. He must have been then no more than 18. Uh, so I went and I had a very nice evening. He then wrote to tell me that he'd been accepted into Cranwell. I wrote back and congratulated him. Then he wrote to tell me that he'd been picked to fly fast jets. 
So I wrote back and congratulated him. And I must admit, I like to think now he's too busy to think of phoning, but it was just such a success story from one of my very first cadets. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, if they've been good cadets, um, I say to them, if you are applying for a job and you want a reference, and I don't say this to all of them, you want a reference, I will give you a reference. And we've had a couple who have come back and asked for references, haven't we? Yeah. Um, but they do particularly enjoy royal visits. The Prince of Wales came to um, uh, Mercer a week on fr week last Friday, and the three cadets came. Um, by golly, they looked smart. I mean, they were incredibly smart. And we, um, they, they were told that they could um, open the doors. Uh, two of the cadet, two of the three, could open the cadet, open the doors as um, as the royal car arrived, and another could open the door for him to go through. And if it had been raining, they'd have had umbrellas, and and they loved it. I mean, they really did, and they felt very much part of the event. I'm slightly put off because I can't decide whether this is picking up my heartbeat or, or whether I'm hearing a drum. <laughs> but I, all I can hear is a thud, thud. And I think, it's oh well, outside. it's outside. <laughs> <laughs> what a relief. Boom, buddy, boom, buddy, boom. Um, I, have, I have links with the civic community, industrial, social leaders in the county. Um, and because I'm in office rather longer than mayors or, or the high sheriffs and things, I, I have a little more experience and I can try and use my experience to pull this rather disparate rump of a county together. Because if you look at what's left of Mid Morgan now, and now they've taken the Rumley Valley away and put it into Gwent, um, we don't have a focal point. Uh, what have I got? I mean, basically I've got Mercer, which is a small town, Pontypridd, which is a small town, Bridgend, which is a small town, Porthcourt, which is a small town. There isn't, West Glamorgan has got Swansea. East Glamorgan has got Cardiff or South Glamorgan. We've got nothing. And Mary and I constantly struggle to find venues that are big enough to be able to put on an all-county event. And it really is very difficult. And I don't think it's something that was taken into account. And I had not help us when they bring in their new ideas when Bridgend, you'll be disappearing down to Neath Port Talbot or heaven help you, Swansea. I can only say that I will fight it to the last breath of my body. However, what Midland Morgan does have in abundance is history and character, and it makes it a very worthwhile county to be Lord Lieutenant of. I've, I've brought um, some things to show you because I do actually have a lot of fun. This is the programme from the National Service of Thanksgiving to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen at St Paul's Cathedral. This here, even more exciting, is the programme from the marriage of, P of um, uh, William and Kate that I was lucky enough to go to. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, this is the um, service to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the coronation at Westminster Abbey. This is um, a service of thanksgiving from Land of Cathedral for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Um, this is the diamond wedding anniversary of the Queen at Westminster Abbey. And uh, this is a um, service of Thanksgiving and the, the lunch afterwards at the Guild Hall. But I must tell you about William and Kate's wedding. I've got another. I'm okay for time. Because I can't go without like telling you about William and Kate's <laughs> wedding. I was, um, uh, I was sitting in a bar in um, Singapore drinking a Singapore sling when, with my sister um, when uh, my text made a noise and I looked at it and it was a text from my son. You are invited to the wedding. Do you want to go? <laughs> well, obviously I said yes. Um, it, it was utterly incredible. Most of these things that, that are here 
Um, I don't know whether Westminster, uh, Westminster Abbey particularly, if you can visualize it, it's almost in the shape of a cross. And everything I'd been to, we'd been down one of the side aisles of the cross, which means you don't see people coming in and you don't see anything very much, but it's lovely because you're there. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, this would be lovely. I don't guarantee I'm going to see anything. So I put it all onto tape on the television and things. And we set off. We had to set off very early because we had to be there by um, quarter past eight, I think. Um, and we were quarter past eight getting there. So it meant we'd left my club at about quarter to eight. And we didn't come out until quarter past one without going to the loo. <laughs> um, but we went in and my ticket I hadn't really noticed but it said uh, North Isle um, it didn't, what did it say I can't remember it said something like that anyway it turned out that I was on the nave where people all came in not only that but I was front row on the nave I couldn't believe it so um, I mean we were all chatting and, and, and it was lovely, it was very informal, everybody was standing up and chatting to everybody else and the television cameras were moving up and down opposite and then I got a text from another of my sons saying, um, will you get off the television? <laughs> uh, uh, and then they came in and they said, uh, can you all go to your seats, please? And then William and Harry arrived. And, and it, but, but everybody walked in past me, all, all the foreign royals and all the the, um, the heirs to the throne from Denmark and Holland and Spain and, you know, the whole lot. And everybody was trying to work out who was who and, and all this. It was, it was the most memorable experience, apart from my own wedding, which I don't remember much about, <laughs> <laughs> that I have ever had. It was absolutely fabulous. Uh, and then, of course, Kate and her father walked right past me. It was utterly, utterly wonderful. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, there is, it's, some of it's hard work um, and graft, but I've just had such fun doing things like um, consultation in Windsor Castle over a weekend, um, the royal wedding, um, jubilee year, we had the Queen two days running, which is absolutely unheard of. I'd been to the services in St. Paul's. Um, I went to a reception at St. James's Palace and another party in Windsor Castle. I've, um, not since I'm Lord Lieutenant, but I have in the past spent a night on the Royal Train when I was chairing the Prince's Trust. I've been to Highgrove innumerable times. I've spent a weekend at Sandringham. I have had a fabulous 11 years. I got five years to go. Oh, I said I wasn't going to tell you that. I got five years to go, and I don't know whether they'll be as good as the past 11, but if they're even half as good, I am one very, very, very lucky lady. Thank you. I did confess over lunch that I knew very little, if, if anything at all, about the role of the Lord Lieutenant. Now I do know, and I'm glad that the Lord Lieutenant of Middle Morgan is Mrs. Kate Thomas. I think she's doing a remarkable job, and uh, may you have a further five years of excitement. <laughs> Now, I'm conscious of the time, that, and I'm conscious of the fact that we have an AGM, so I'm going to uh, limit the questions or comments to three. So, who have, do you have a question or a comment to make on this talk? Right. Please, we have to know what did you wear for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, if I say, I'll start with... I wore a Marks and Spencer skirt <laughs> to go with my Marks and Spencer's earrings. Um, but I had a, a nice plain black skirt and I had um, an, an ivory silk jacket that I wore on the top. Yeah, and my hat I had specially made. <laughs> very small, very small. Right. Can I say it was a complete privilege to serve uh, on the middle of the of the party when you chair it. But my question, how much time does this take out of your life? It, 
It varies enormously, David. Um, uh, I mean, at this time, probably it's been taken quite a bit because we had a royal visit to, to organise. Um, immediately after Christmas, there was nothing on in January, early February, and now it's just really beginning to take off. But I'm probably out doing something three days of most weeks, um, probably with two evenings, something like that. Yeah. It's, it's not, I mean, if you're Lord Lieutenant of South Glamorgan, it's infinitely more onerous because you've got various royals in and out of Cardiff all the time, but not to Mid Glamorgan. Yes, Chris. Yes, Chairman. Well, it was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Sir David. Uh, has there been any consideration given to changing the title? It's a very, very old role, of course, or no doubt, and I shall be afraid. But the fact that Victor Morgan is off the local government map now, it's not going to the the different counties. Has there been any consideration given to changing it, making a Lord Lieutenant for? You know, different area of the county. No, I think um, I think probably not. Um, when they divvied up the county, I mean, they made such a mess of the Welsh counties, one way and another. You know, you had in the west, you had Cardiganshire, Carmarthenshire, and Pembrokeshire. Uh, well, a lot of they, they've gone back to being individuals now, but there is now what they call the preserved county of Dovid, because Her Majesty does not want to have to keep finding. I mean, it, in my area, you'd have a Lord Lieutenant for Mercer and a Lord Lieutenant for Bridge End, and a, which just wouldn't work. It's when they start fiddling with the preserved counties that it gets really awkward. And that's what they did when they took um, Rumney Valley away from me and put it into the preserved county of Gwent. May rot their souls. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> I now call on a good friend and a fellow committee member, Margaret Williams, to move the vote of thanks. Right. So what do I use now? Pat? Just to <laughs> Okay. Right. Well, what a lovely afternoon we've had. Um, sorry, okay. I'm trying not to drop it. Um, I must apologise for the heartbeat in the background. <laughs> I'm not sure what it was either. As long as it wasn't me. I, I don't think it was. I think it came from there. Um, I'm very envious of you attending these things, but I'm absolutely appalled that you don't have a dress allowance. <laughs> you know, that, that should be put right, I think. You know. So, um, but it's been a lovely talk, a lovely afternoon. And I'm sure you would want me on your behalf to say thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for telling us about your life. It's been most interesting. Thank you. Microphone, but I'm just going to say please accept these oh. with our thanks. Oh, thank you. That's lovely. Thank you all very much. Really, right. it's lovely. That brings us to the end. I'd like to add my my own personal thanks to both Kate and Mary. They've been good company this afternoon. I enjoyed my time at lunch with them. They're excellent people. So now I'm going to tell you in my language, Diolch yn fawr, Kate. Diolch yn fawr, Mary. A pleser mawr i gwrndor do chi prawma. Diolch i chdwyr chi. Diolch. Diolch. Diolch.